of the Kenmore Planning Commission. First item on the agenda is citizen comment. From looking at the chamber audience section, I see no citizens present to render comment. So we've satisfied this element of the agenda. The next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve. The first is the October 6, 2015 meeting minutes. And before we vote on this motion, I, I wanted to make a um, proposed revision. As reluctant as I am to even touch the issue of Winthrow, I did see one clause that I'd like to fine tune here. And it's on page two, section four, first paragraph, second to last sentence. There is a series of items that are attributed to me. And the last clause of that sentence says, and we could not expect citizens to follow regulations. And um, I realize that these minutes are a paraphrase of what we said for the sake of brevity. So I understand why you put that. That would probably overstate what I said, which this implies nobody would follow it. And I think I had concerns that compliance would be very limited. I would expect some people to follow it. So my proposal is that we change that to say, and he had concerns that compliance may be very limited. So that's my proposal. Any objections? None? Okay, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes as amended? I move to, I move to um, approve the minutes as amended. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Yes. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All aye. opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries. The minutes are approved for October 6th. The next set of minutes is, are those for October 22nd, 2015. Do I hear any uh, proposed revisions? No. Do I hear a motion to approve? Move to approve. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? There being none, the motion carries. The minutes are approved. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is micro housing apartments. And I call to the presentation table the city staff. <coughs> Good evening, Planning Commission. So uh, the focus will now be on micro-housing given the council direction at your joint meeting to sort of delay um, taking up the issue of tiny housing. So you've already had some discussion about uh, micro-housing and so this is now sort of bringing back um, the changes that you discussed and then if we can sort of reach consensus on those then we might be able to move forward with scheduling a public hearing. So I'm going to hand this over to Laurie, and she can kind of take it from here. Thank you. Good evening. So the memo that I uh, sent out uh, with the agenda included the recommended amendments. As you recall, and it's been quite a while, at the first meeting when we discussed microhousing apartments, there was a concern raised over the revised definition of dwelling unit and, and the uh, use of the term usually containing kitchen facilities. Um, and so I went back and tried to rework that and came up with another uh, definition of dwelling unit. Again, this is on the first page of the memo that more specifically talks about what uh, a microhousing dwelling unit kitchen facility might be and indicates that it could in fact be shared with other microhousing uh, dwelling units. So that was uh, the change made in response to your concerns. And then on the following pages, it's actually attachment one, are all of the changes that would be applied to uh, allow microhousing and, and confirm what the microhousing apartment standards are uh, in the city. So with that, I'm available to answer questions. Anybody have any questions for Lori? Microhousing? None? I'm sorry. Carol? I'm turning to the page. That okay. Sorry. 
Well, uh, Carol's looking, you know, something mm -hmm. came up. I think I, I didn't read it in these materials, but I think uh -huh. I read it somewhere else. And somebody expressed concern that the 0.6 per dwelling unit parking requirement right. uh, might create problems because people might have more cars than expected, and that would create a parking problem. Um, it, it, that certainly is possible. Uh, as you recall, uh, the number, the reduced number came out or was recommended uh, based on a couple of traffic studies, one in Seattle, one in Redmond, where they actually looked at how many cars microhousing dwelling unit um, occupants had and how many people were actually living in those microhousing uh, dwelling units. And the conclusion was that it was less than a standard uh, apartment, which was uh, the reason that we recommended a lower parking standard as long as the unit was within a certain distance of uh, SR 522. Um, the .6 itself was chosen uh, because that matched the Transit Oriented Development District uh, parking ratio and that seemed to be a good uh, reference point since those apartments were assumed to be ones that people would would live in who were interested in using transit. But there wasn't a necessary correlation between that 0.6 number and the experience of microhousing in these areas? Um, I can tell you what the experience in the other, um, if I can quickly find it, we'll see if I can find it. In some of the, um, pages that you gave us in July, you actually included um, a study that Seattle did, but that the city of Kirkland reported different findings. Right. So um, the information was um, a 2013 city of Seattle study concluded that only one third of microhousing residents owned or had access to a car. Um, the City of Kirkland reports that an August 2012 travel survey of residents in Redmond microhousing projects showed that only 35% drove to work compared with a 76% Redmond average. So Kirkland concluded that these survey responses um, supported the notion that residents who live in microhousing are also choosing to alter their transportation choices and they chose a .5 space per unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, microhousing parking ratio. Okay. Carol, did you want to? So, are you saying that because of those surveys and because we really are considered a transit corridor, and I'm thinking about how Redmond is set up mm -hmm. and the walkability to transit is different in Redmond than it is here, and and you look at our map, are you saying that these are, you would recommend these parking ratios? because the dwelling units for the developments are within that quarter mile ax, you know, walk, walkability to the transit corridor. Right, there, there are two factors uh, resulting in that reduced parking ratio recommendation. One is the size of the units, which almost certainly uh, would mean that most units would be occupied by one person and not more than one person. Okay. Um, so that's one factor, so I would anticipate fewer residents. And then the second factor again was th that these units often are located in areas of transit, and so if they are within the walking distance to transit, we thought a reduced parking ratio was appropriate. Do you have any studies uh, with the new apartments at the Spencer 68, how their parking ratios are working for the residents there, even though those are larger units? Yeah, I, I don't have that information. Okay. We certainly could. Because uh, they're definitely within that quarter mile of the transit corridor. Right. We certainly could pull the information. I'm not sure, you know, that there's been a long enough history. I'm not even sure that they're all full. And they're not yet. the same kind of so, dwelling place. Right. But right. there's still people that are already there. Mm -hmm. And I know that parking is tight there. Mm -hmm. And it would be tighter in these micro-housing developments. 
Well, if we reduce the parking ratio, yes, there would be less parking for the building. Okay. Yeah. And the upside of reducing the ratio is to allow the developer to put more units in the building. Correct. Right. It's an incentive. And if the commission is not comfortable with it, we can go back to the 1.2, which is a studio apartment unit, or we can choose someplace in between one parking stall per unit. I think 1.2 is overkill. Mm -hmm. I think you're bound to end up with extra stalls mm -hmm. because there also still is the guest parking ratio, which requires uh, for every five units, you have to provide one guest parking stall. Okay. But yeah, right. Go ahead. Um, we, as I recall, we limited microhousing to certain zoning areas. Mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, well, to, to multifamily zones, there was no uh, limitation beyond that. If apartments were allowed, then microhousing apartments so would be allowed. If we look at that map of where they would be allowed, mm -hmm. is that, what, how does that match up to the one quarter mile? Uh, there's definitely multifamily areas outside of the one quarter mile. Yeah. I would be interested in thinking about maybe we have a variable requirement depending upon whether you're, you're within that quarter mile or something. Well, the proposal is that you would have the reduced ratio within the one quarter mile and beyond that you went back to 1.2, the studio okay. apartment Great. ratio. Okay. Great. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Mark. Yeah, I, I had actually the exact same question before Doug raised it. Um, so what would be, so say, Say everybody there does have a car and we do go with 0 0.6. I mean, h mm -hmm. how much, you know, street parking is there? What, you know, what are the, what are the, some of the scenarios about parking availability in, you know, in the downtown 522 corridor, so assuming that's where most of these would, would locate? Right. So I think there is a parking issue downtown currently. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I think that the multifamily units farther out where they may or may not be desirable, that wouldn't be the same issue. So in some ways it speaks to the reverse of what we're, uh, what we're proposing. Um, Again, I don't have hard studies for microhousing apartment units. All I have is this anecdotal information from Seattle and from Kirkland based on the Redmond studies. And Seattle is certainly a very different place than Kenmore, um, as is Redmond, although I'm not sure Seattle has an excess of, of street parking. So um, I think if the commission is uncomfortable with the reduction, we certainly could stick with one uh, stall per unit, maybe just a slight reduction. And then if we uh, see developments come into the city, we could more accurately understand how the parking might work. If, if even that seems to, um, to go too far, we could stay with the 1.2 and not offer any parking reduction. The parking reduction is an incentive, but also we don't want to overbuild the parking. And as you know, there have been a number of studies on traditional multifamily in the area that say there's too much parking being provided. Could you review? Could you review for us how the microhousing development benefits work for the developer? In terms of, I, I mean, know. part of the motivation for doing extending permitting for microhousing and making that to incentivize that type of building is so that the developers get these, you know, some kind of a benefit package or incentive to them. Can, can you describe the difference between microhousing and just a standard development? So, so there's no incentive for microhousing. Okay. There's no density incentive. There's no affordability requirement. None of that, which is, on the other hand, part of the transit-oriented development uh, rules. For microhousing, the only change from a standard apartment in terms of, of um, uh, development requirements is this proposed parking reduction. And it was proposed not so much to offer them an incentive. We never went into this program really to encourage 
microhousing apartments in Kenmore, but to perhaps reflect the fact that we don't think there will be as much parking required, and we don't want to put extra parking on a site which has all kinds of adverse impacts to the community, more impervious surface, um, and that kind of thing. So it wasn't, it may be an incentive because they don't have to provide as much parking, but it wasn't created to, uh, created as an incentive. Does that help? It does. Okay. Mark? I was just curious about the, you know, you mentioned the trade off. Uh, do you have any mm -hmm. idea of what the trade off would be in terms of like numbers of units per parking space going with, you know, 0. 0.6 versus 1 or 1.2? Or does that really totally depend on what the developer has in mind, or? Well, it, I mean, it's a, I'm not quite sure I'm following your question. It's a strict standard. So if you were doing 10 units and you had a 0.6 ratio, you'd be required to provide six parking stalls. If you had a 1.2 ratio, you'd be required to provide, is that 12 parking stalls? Uh, for 10 units, 1.2. So it doesn't affect the number of units that could be built? No. Well, uh, it, it does. The, the only way it affects the number of units that could be built would be how much space you had to uh, utilize for your parking, whether you were doing a surface lot or whether you were putting it under the building or... Uh, so it has a relationship in that you're using space that you might use for something else. But the density, there's no change in the density requirement uh, related to microhousing apartments. Okay, no further questions? So at this point, I think we need to decide whether to move forward, adopt a proposal for, a next, for an upcoming public hearing? Correct. Is that right? If, if you want to move the recommendations forward, the public hearing would not be scheduled at your next meeting, would, but would be um, likely scheduled that first meeting in December. We have a 14-day notice period that has to run. Okay. Do I hear a motion regarding the proposal? I'd like to move that we uh, accept the proposal, I guess. The okay. Proposal. We have a motion to accept the microhousing proposal as amended, I assume, the most recent version. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll Great. second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor of the, uh, of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? There being that none, the motion carries and the proposal is approved go forward to public hearing. Right. So uh, again, likely at that December 1st meeting, uh, the public hearing will be held. And then after that, you can have deliberation on what your ultimate recommendation to the city council will Including be. Including the parking. Including okay. parking. Yeah, right. I, I wonder if that issue could be somehow highlighted. I don't know. That, I mean, that, you know, I well, agree. <laughs> Right. Um, right. Uh, and and um, I too can spend some time seeing if I can find any other more specific information that would be helpful. I did quite a search for it, but I'll I'll look again and see if we have some better information. All right. That satisfies that element of the agenda. The well hidden agenda. <laughs> Completely absent agenda. Do we um, have an agenda? Please. Next item on the agenda, I think, is communication facilities. Yes. So this is so. The, the first time this topic will be introduced to you, so the, the goal tonight is to give you some background about what the telecommunications chapter is, uh, why. Uh, this is important for amendment and kind of highlighting the fact that we need to amend it to be in compliance with some federal law that has changed. And it's also an opportunity to take a look at amending the code to address um, some issues that have, that have come up as, you know, this, this um, chapter has been implemented over the last few years. 
So um, I think this is probably this is a brand new topic for all the planning commission here, I, I believe. Um, so on that, um, I think uh, Laurie has a little PowerPoint presentation, um, just to kind of um, highlight uh, some of the background issues, um, give you some context, and then we can kind of move into some discussion. Okay, so the goal of uh, this PowerPoint Wonderful. is not to um, raise topics for future discussion or anything like that. What I've tried to do here uh, is to sort of summarize what the existing uh, chapter 18.60 of the zoning code says about communication facilities. It's a very dense chapter. A lot of terminology that I certainly was not familiar <laughs> with. Um, so what I've tried to do is simplify it with this PowerPoint. And then after that, uh, you may well have questions. And then what I hope we can do is identify topics that we need to be certain that we hit on over the next few meetings uh, prior to um, making an effort to craft revised regulations. And I, I will say, having looked at this now for a while, that, uh, that I think uh, from, from staff's perspective that actually rewriting this chapter rather than trying to amend it uh, may be useful, hoping to simplify it, making it easier to understand, that kind of thing. So with that, I will jump right in. <laughs> So the first, one of the first sections in this chapter talks about the purpose and goals of the communications facilities uh, regulations. And I've uh, not included all of them here, uh, but hopefully caught the, the most uh, significant ones. And these are the ones that I'm going to talk a little bit more about as we go through the presentation. So purpose and goals, the first to provide for wireless communication facilities. We all use them. Uh, they're very important to the community and becoming more so. Uh, so the goal certainly is to accommodate wireless communication facilities uh, for use by the citizenry. The next goal is to encourage the location of these facilities in non-residential areas. So that's right in the purpose and goals section. Uh, third, encourage joint use of facilities and minimize the number of support structures. So many of the towers and poles in the community house antennas from a variety of carrier, carriers. They're not just one carrier per pole. And so the goal here is to encourage joint use of the facilities so we don't have to have as many poles or towers. Uh, minimize adverse visual impacts. Uh, the fourth bullet point here, uh, promote facility safety. The city is restricted from doing any regulation relative to things like NIER and shock and burn and that kind of thing. Instead, the city uh, can check to be certain that the people who are installing the facilities meet the federal standards. Uh, so there are federal standards, and the city's job, if they wish to, is to confirm that those standards are met. And last, to comply with the FCC rules. That's, that's similar. So in 1996, uh, the original FCC rules about wireless communications were put in place. There have been a couple amendments since that time and a significant amendment uh, last spring, which is the one Debbie was referring to, that really uh, warrants uh, an amendment to the regulations. So this was a 2016 docket item, uh, but because of the um, you guys are so speedy. And we uh, also are not taking on the tiny house topic. That's why we're starting it in 2015. The council had given us permission to do that. And, and so we'll carry over hopefully not too far into 2016. But that's why we're moving ahead. So how, what does the chapter do about wireless communication facilities? First of all, it defines what they are. And it defines it. Uh, the facilities either as a major or a minor communication facility. And those facilities are defined by type of signal. So uh, rather than 
by size, height, location, any other physical feature, uh, this particular code defines it by type of signal. Uh, then it talks about where are the antennas located? What are the support structures? So the, the uh, support structures, the, that term is used to refer to lattice towers, and I think you all know what those look like, and monopoles. We could, if we're light enough out, we could look out and see. There's one right out in front of City Hall, a monopole. And then the second uh, category of support structure is an alternative support structure. And by that, the code means buildings, uh, water towers, light poles, anything other than a monopole or a tower. For example, Bastyr University Water Tower has a number of wireless communication facilities on it. And then the code also specifies exemptions. And some of those uh, uh, two-way radio for emergency communications, uh, remote control cars, uh, toys, uh, that kind of thing. But then the exemption section also talks about other kinds of modifications to conforming and non-conforming structures. So that may be something we want to look at. So again, one of the goals, encourage location in non-residential areas. So how does uh, this chapter do that? Uh, this chapter, working in conjunction with all of the zoning districts, sets out the review processes for both towers and for antennas. So um, the chapter has a table, but there are also standards in the use tables in some of the zones that talk about the review processes. And those processes are most intensive for support structures in residential zones and least intensive for antennas in commercial zones. How does the current code encourage joint use of facilities and minimize support structures? Uh, again, the review processes are most intensive for new support structures. So you'll, you'll have a far easier time of it if you're trying to co-locate on an existing facility than if you're trying to create a new facility. Uh, the modification criteria are more relaxed. Uh, there actually is a requirement for a co-location feasibility analysis. So if you were proposing a new tower, you would actually have to do an analysis of options uh, is there some place where you actually could do a co-location rather than creating a new facility? Uh, and then the placement of antennas on existing or replacement structures in the right-of-way, uh, that's the preferred alternative in residential neighborhoods. Minimizing adverse visual impacts. So there are a number of things uh, in the chapter that try to achieve that goal. First of all, of course, there are setback and height regulations, and those vary um, depending on the zone. There are landscaping requirements at the base, for example, of a tower where the equipment sits. Uh, there are color and lighting standards. Uh, for example, the colors are supposed to be gray, blue, brown, green, things that maybe blend a little better than a shiny pole. Um, locational priorities are identi identified for alternative transmission support structures. So should you be in the middle of the building? Should you be close to the edge? Um, it talks about uh, where the best location would be. And then there are standards to reduce the degree of visual impact, including flush mounting. And this is a big one and, um, and one that uh, we should be pretty clear about. So flush mounting means that rather than having a long arm out the side of your pole or off the edge of your building or whatever, you are required to bring it in flush or close to flush with the facade. So on a tower, uh, maybe it's 6 or 12 inches that you can move out from the pole before you're supposed to have your antenna. You can't stick out a long ways. Now this is, uh, is an issue particularly for these new FCC rules that I mentioned that went into effect last spring. Those rules allow modifications um, that seem to work in ways um, very much counter to flush mounting. And so there may be a need to talk about, well, what is flush mounting? Is it, um, is it an aesthetic thing? Is it a way to conceal, uh, the, uh, conceal the 
the antennas so they're not so obvious. We'll have to get into that discussion a little bit. And then lastly, uh, there is a requirement to remove facilities that are no longer in use. So every time a tower or an antenna is approved, there is a, um, a document that goes along with it that says we agree to remove it at the time it's no longer in use. Promoting facility safety, this is, uh, I mentioned this a little bit, but the city, again, can check to be sure that uh, any facility is, complies with the FCC's uh, standards, these NIER exposure standards, shock and burn, and radio frequency radiation standards. Again, we can't create our own standards. Uh, we're prohibited from doing that. But we can uh, ask someone to verify, perhaps uh, through a letter from a professional uh, electrical engineer, that the, the standards are met. There are fencing and signage standards to keep people away from uh, the equipment, warning signs, that kind of thing. Uh, there's compliance with federal interference rules and regulations. And then uh, the code also includes a separation requirement from residential living spaces and schools. Other things uh, complying with FCC rules, so as I mentioned, 1996 is when the first set of standards came out. And the code as written uh, reflects those earlier uh, requirements. Um, again, the safety standards rely on the FCC requirements. But we do need to think about developing new rules related to facility modifications, those new standards that came out uh, last spring. And lastly, I wanted just to touch on a couple of other components that didn't fit very well under the heading of, of um, purpose and goals. And those uh, were that the current code ha requires a pre-application community meeting uh, for someone who wants to do a new communication facility. So that means that before they apply, they have to have a community meeting, and, and I wanted to point out uh, that they have, to, I de they have to provide a sketch of the facility. If folks are notified, I think it's within 500 feet or at least 20 property owners. Um, a city staff person has to be in attendance at the meeting, but the meeting is conducted by the applicant. Uh, and attendees uh, can propose alternative sites for the facility within a quarter mile, and then the applicant is supposed to analyze those sites, again, trying to get to the notion of, um, of co-location, if at all possible. And lastly, I wanted to mention that this, uh, the code gives the city the authority to retain expert review at the applicant's expense to try to uh, provide um, an expert opinion when there are questions that uh, staff cannot answer or needs assistance with. So that is my brief overview, very simplified <laughs> uh, version of this chapter that I'm sure you all looked at. Uh, and now what I was hoping we could do is turn to the last page in uh, your memo. starting on page three. And what we tried to do here was to um, identify some topics that after we reviewed 1860, after we tried to do this summary of what was covered by eight, chapter 1860, the, the items that jumped out at us uh, for future discussion. So I can go through these one by one, or you can ask me questions, or you can make suggestions, however you wish to proceed. Is there a preference? I'm inclined to go through them one by one, because it's pretty dense stuff. OK. All right, so uh, the first proposed topic uh, from staff's perspective is the categorization of facilities. I mentioned that major and minor uh, communication facilities are described in the code, um, but uh, I think staff feels that there are better ways that these things could be categorized. And I've uh, begun look, looking at uh, what other jurisdictions have been doing, and, and my initial reaction is maybe we need a different categorization scheme 
rather than trying to figure out what kind of a signal does this antenna send and is it that this megahertz or whatever. Anyway, for land use purposes, that's a very difficult definition. So that was one topic. Right, and to see if, if there are thoughts that you have about the topics, uh, immediate questions that come to mind or things that should be added to the topics. Uh, having looked at both the chapter and um, the summary of the chapter, and, and there may not be any, but I, I, if you have questions that are burning questions, let me know. <laughs> how burning <laughs> shock and burn standards <laughs> we're still trying to acquire the lingo <laughs> yeah exactly a lot of the focus here is as you said is on land use mm -hmm. approaching this as a land use issue but as I thought about this more and thinking about the technology changes particularly since even as recently as 1996 we have more smart devices we have wireless communications all sorts, uh, and I'm wondering how, where is our scope here? Because I can see this, we could get into aerial drone, you know, so much is controlled mm -hmm. uh, by wireless communication today and so much more is going to be. So when I think about things like location, then I think, you know, this becomes less of a question of how does this appear, I think that's still important, but what does that do in terms of interference, how do, how do should we be concerned about when we're looking and evaluating whether or not it's appropriate to put something in a certain place? Should be wor worried about how that location might impact communication for other multiple devices? Is there a technology issue, or is that out of scope? I think that's out of scope. I do think that uh, you know the focus of this chapter it's in the zoning code it really has to do with land use and permitting of these facilities wherever they may be however I certainly think there's a uh, a component uh, that will require some review by someone with some expertise and we have already a telecommunications provider who has volunteered to to look at the rules and and it may be that I will try to reach out to others as well as we develop them to see if there are uh, technological issues that we are somehow missing as we move ahead. I know, for example, that there's a, a new focus on very small uh, communication facilities. That, but because they're small, you need a lot more of them. And and how um, whatever scheme we come up with might interface with this newer technology I think is an important question and one that probably I cannot answer but hopefully the industry uh, can provide some assistance with that. Well thank you that, that helps me with the scope issue I, I don't think I would want to see us get into some of the technical right. minutiae but if right. we had to ensure that when this is finally written that there's some flexibility in here to do what I think you just said which is there's some sort of certification or showing as part of that uh, uh, presentation that there's been some consideration for these other issues, which mm -hmm. will change and develop over time. And we couldn't anticipate now. I think that'd be sufficient for me. It's interesting to note that at the beginning of um, this information that you gave us that the FCC rules and the local laws were created in 1934 for telecommunications and then they weren't changed until 1996 but from 1996 until now they're like they're following the quick turnover of how technology is developed mm -hmm. and so technology standards from say 1990 had maybe a three four year turnover and then it went down to two years and then 18 months and now we're at these you know, so much is being invented quickly. Right. So I can see why we want to simplify this code so that we can respond in a flexible way to the opportunities that residents have to participate in newer technologies. But I also know from the history of the city that putting in these poles was a big deal and people didn't like it. Even though they wanted use of that technology, they didn't want it in their neighborhoods. So that's really what these ordinances are going to help us deal with, right? Right. Okay. 
So go ahead, Deborah. Just taking on to that, my, my um, comment of just we had an issue with a cell tower in our neighborhood, and um, I, I I don't know whether it would be covered here somehow, but um, and I I did read through. Um, it, 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 I don't know whether that needs to be strengthened or the communication process uh, in terms of notifying neighbors or, I mean, it seems like it's all there and yet I think about what our experience was and it doesn't seem to fit with the code and so that's why I, I don't know. I, I would love to hear more about that, I guess. Do you, do you know uh, when that tower was permitted? I mean, it would have been maybe a year and a half ago. So very recent. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and do you have intersection? I mean, it ended up with the neighbors, not I was only peripherally involved, kind yeah. of argued the point, and it wasn't done. So, I mean, that's why the, the process is a little opaque to me. <laughs> so, um, so are you saying that there was a tower built? There was built? a proposal. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. And I, I mean, we heard about it from a neighbor, even though yeah. we're very, very close by. There was it, no direct notification. There, I wasn't aware of any community meetings. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't the process that I kind of see in writing here. So, yeah. Probably in the right of way. May have been in the right of way, which is a, a somewhat different process potentially, it, or yeah. just an antenna yeah. rather than a pole. Yeah, because the yeah. right of ways it can be on residential. I mean, it's a residential street, but mm -hmm. you can still have it there. Yeah, it was in the right of way. So we can go. All sides of streets are right of ways, right? I mean, basically. Streets are right of ways, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> in other words, they can show up in any neighborhood. I mean, it makes it seem like that residential neighborhoods are, you know, kind of the last resort, and yet. They're all right of way. There's right of ways in every right. residential neighborhood. So, so this definitely gets to the second bullet point. Okay. Uh, or that maybe it's more the um, it's part of the second point, but then also review processes. So this is a topic uh, that we thought was important was to talk about what the priorities are for siting, and then to make those review processes reflect. The preferred hierarchy so we thought that was an important topic and I think yeah. uh, your comments just now would feed right into that topic uh, that we could provide some background information and then talk about uh, what the priorities should be for location so I'm trying to come up with a framework for addressing this efficiently mm -hmm. as efficiently as we can and so I want to you know I may have misunderstood your presentation a little bit but I see all these proposed topics. Are you asking us to approve or revise these proposed topics, or do you want to take them up now? I do not want to take them up now. Okay. <laughs> I'm not ready to take them up. Right. Um, so really, the goal is to say, are these the topics? Okay. Are there particular facets of the topics that I should know about as I move forward to bring them forward for your discussion? Uh, so I think from Deborah, what I've learned is that uh, residential issues in the right of way may be something uh, that would fit, it needs to be touched on uh, through these topics. Um, but again, we can go through and I can just itemize what they are, or if you want to say, you know, I've read through these topics and these are fine, or you're missing something, that's fine as well. Okay. Anybody else? A couple questions. Yep. Um, um, the new FCC um, rules that you mentioned, those were not included in this, right? Uh, well, they're Those not regulations. included in the existing chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, the process was such that the city had to comp begin complying with it last April. So there is an already an internal pr permit process that reflects those requirements because we had to we have to conform to them even if the code is not yet amended. So is it possible to find out what those differences are? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, great. And um, okay. 
Right. It's, it's not clear, but incorporation of new standards for facility modifications is that topic. So oh, we'll okay. talk about the, F the new FCC rules and what the differences are. They're really quite striking. Okay. So we definitely will have to talk about that. Okay, great. And then when it comes to allowable height, mm -hmm. could we get background information about what the differences are when it comes to different heights? Yeah. That would be helpful in that discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can see how because technology is changing, old technologies will remain there. But you'll be adding new forms of technology. So does the city have any way to make an old form of technology obsolete and move into like a new realm of technology? I, I, it's not like we take down our telephone poles and get rid of the telephone wires, but a lot of people have moved that direction where they don't necessarily have those hardwired phones anymore. I, I think maybe what you're asking about is nonconformance, what we do with poles that don't meet our standards, is that? Yeah, I, I mean, I can see that we're being driven to make amendments to our ordinances because the FCC has changed their rules. Right. Probably as a city, we wouldn't even look at this stuff unless we had to, right? Mm -hmm. Or would we look at it because a new technology is approaching our city to serve our citizens? I, we would be looking at this chapter just because internally it has some problems. Okay. And there have been concerns about interpretation and what does this mean, and there are some cross-references that aren't accurate, okay. et cetera. So there was a fundamental problem with the structure of the chapter okay. uh, that has coincided with these new FCC rules that need to be incorporated into the chapter. So both of those things are influencing it. And are you looking at how other cities that might be a little ahead of us in this process are doing it? Yep, absolutely. And is that, is that what's motivating this list of things to look at to work on? Uh, that did not motivate the list of topics, but certainly that information will be coming back to you as we discuss the okay. topics. Okay. That's good. Yeah, Mike. I had a few additional uh, topics that came to my mind as I read through some of this that I could mention, and maybe we could uh, either discuss if they warrant further investigation or if they're not really relevant to what we need to investigate. Um, the first was if we had any consideration around penalties to the carriers or their subcontractors for noncompliance to code. If we have... Oh, enforcement? Enforcement. Okay. Um, and related to that, if there was a component in the code for notice to neighbors for um, enhancement work or modifications going on to existing towers or if a new tower is being built. Okay. Um, I also had a question about um, jurisdictional issues between FCC regulations and other uh, governing bodies like FAA because I'm assuming there's probably wireless governance over what's happening at Kenmore Air and the bandwidth they use for air traffic um, and if that needs to be uh, captured in our in our documentation if, if there's anything that we need to think about there for example okay. right if, if somebody was putting a cellular tower near Log Boom Park, if that would create interference for air traffic communication, if that's something we need to be concerned about, or, or if that's somehow self-policing within uh, the cell phone carrier industry. Okay. Um, other cross-jurisdictional stuff I was thinking about was um, Homeland Security, if there's any issues or updates that we need to consider uh, with the Homeland Security Act, um, and then maybe a bit of an edge case, but anything related to NAFTA and foreign carriers for anyone that's traveled in the San Juan Island, Islands and has ended up on a Canadian carrier and then received a three or four hundred dollar cell phone bill. Yeah. Um, are we getting into the area where we're starting to have carrier, would there be a situation where we would have non-US carrier penetration into this area? I think that probably is beyond the scope. 
Okay. So, um, again, thinking about this in, in terms of the zoning and the land use, so what we're really looking at is where should it go, what does it look like, how tall should it be, what are the impacts on the neighbors. Uh, so I think that that FCC FAA relationship certainly is something that fits right into that scheme. Um, and the relationship, who, who's monitoring that and is that, is the location of something going to affect one of our important land uses? That fits to me. Mm -hmm. um, the concern about uh, foreign carriers or how the Homeland Security Act may be influencing uh, communications in the city, I think is is kind of a different question. I don't think it's a land use question. It's okay. a different kind of a question. Um, Good distinction. Could I ask, this is probably way off topic, but it's making me think about it since we're talking about the relationship between the FCC and the FAA. Does this have anything to do with the coming market expansion of Amazon and using drones? Um, I, I know Mike <laughs> mentioned drones. Um, drones are not part of this topic. <laughs> okay. Just had to I ask. think we're letting the feds <laughs> For the time being, manage drones. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Mike. Uh, just a little more on the question. Pike, at some point in the discussion, I'd like to hear something about the consistency between communication towers, the height restrictions there, and building height uh, restrictions. Are they consistent oh, with mm -hmm. the zone? And in particular, we had this issue that came up when we were doing the uh, downtown area here about when you're putting communication towers on top of buildings and or even how a communication device on the side of the building might uh, conflict with any side restriction. Uh, so I'd like to understand that a little bit more and, and make sure we're covering that uh, in the new language. Commissioner Orenshaw. <laughs> so um, it says here, uh, uh, the, I think the original uh, 1996 ones, uh, local government not regulate placement construction modification on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emission is to the extent yada, yada, yada. Um, is there any city jurisdiction on other environmental effects? Like? Um, what other environmental effects, you know, you would possibly regulate with other land uses? Well, certainly, uh, I, I, I'm just wondering cri if there's like a, critical yeah. area rules? Well, that or, would certainly be one, I guess, one, one, one example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly looking at how uh, communication facilities might uh, relate to zoning districts uh, was a, um, a topic, locational priorities, uh, it's bullet point number four, different zoning districts may need different approaches. The critical area rules would apply regardless, uh, but there may be some opportunity to talk about um, are certain, can things be prohibited in certain zones and allowed in other zones? I, I think there is more flexibility in that discussion. Now, mind you, we cannot prohibit wireless communication facilities in the city. We don't want to, right? Everybody uses yes. them. But we may be able to some degree to be a little more selective if that's appropriate. So I'm looking at the safety element on your PowerPoint presentation and it mm -hmm. My understanding is we can't do anything about it except by the FCC, except for enforcement. Right. We basically, under the current rules, what we do is we get a letter mm -hmm. from an expert that says this facility complies with these rules. And that's the city's verification that, in fact, they conform to the FCC standards. So, so Mike, you brought up enforcement as one of the topics you mm -hmm. want to get into. Is that something you had in mind? Yeah. I, my sense is with this, a lot of people are aware, including me, of what, what health risks it might create. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are none. Maybe it's negligible. 
but there's enough chatter that I suspect the council and others might be interested in that. So I kind of feel like it's something we should at least speak to. Right. If we can know more about that. Uh, we certainly could. We cannot do anything about it. Oh, I agree it. with that, but I still think <laughs> it, would, it would, I think it would come up if we present this to the council. Uh -huh. And if not, to the, at the public hearing or otherwise. Right. Right. I, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm pausing because I'm not sure that we want to invest a lot of time investigating potential health risks of communication facilities when we're prohibited from doing anything about it. Except and enforcement. So are we... Well, our, sorry, but our enforcement can only be making sure they comply with FCC standards. That's right. the extent of our enforcement. Now, when Mike was talking about enforcement, I assumed that they were doing, putting up intent. I, I thought that uh, Mike meant non-compliance with the, like the zoning standards, like putting up antennas when they shouldn't or that kind of thing. Um, if, if you're talking about safety compliance, again, the city does not have a role, and except if we want to get a letter from somebody that says, yes, they're conforming to the FCC standards, but the city cannot set different standards or that kind of thing. I get that. I was just wondering, is there a way to address whether we can measure this? If it's efficient to do that, we have limited resources, maybe it's not, but I, I just want to explore that. So that, let's say somebody's violating a radiation standard mm -hmm. that the FCC has set. Is there anything we can do to measure that? Is it way outside of our capability? It's way outside of our capability, certainly. Okay. Um, I, I, the, the one thing in the current code that speaks a little bit to that is that there's a, one section, and I think it has to do with the radio frequency radiation. Once a facility is operating, then after, within a period of weeks, uh, uh, there's a requirement that somebody go out, the, the, one of these experts, and measure it along with all the other ambient radiation to be sure it's not exceeding the threshold. So that some of these, um, the letters that we get, we get before an application is approved. We say, it says, you know, you are, uh, the facility as designed is going to comply with the NIER standard. But in this one section, there is this follow-on, which it kind of speaks a little to what you're interested in, which says, okay, well, now that it's up and operational, you have to give us another measurement uh, after the fact. So FCC only requires a one-time measurement within a short period after that's up and operational? No, our, our rules. Our rules. Do. Our rules say confirm to us that you meet the standard, but now that it, you go measure now that it's operational. So that kind of, that's kind of getting to what I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a risk that these standards, that the radiation level might exceed the standard later on? Is it worth trying to have us require another letter at a later point or on a regular interval? Yeah. Annually it, or something like okay. that? Okay, so I will uh, add that to the list about um, I'm going to call it long-term enforcement of the safety standards. Yeah, particularly that... with respect to health. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Vanderlein. I'm wondering how, if we can push this idea of the letter a little bit further, because I think that, that's very, I'm hearing that as an opportunity maybe to make this more of a certification. So if we were, if, if within our purview to be able to ask for the letter, can we be more specific about what we want in the letter? Some of the things we just talked about is that if you're going, whether it's an application process or a notification process, numbers, we're saying you need to tell us about these things. And if we can be more specific about what those things were, and then they could also include things like follow on uh, measurement, that that might give us, we're still within them, we're, we're asking uh, related to safety, but we're also creating an expectation that they're going to give us information on this as part of the public process, we could be taking a look at that and confirming it, or at least you've got somebody at one time across the table telling us that they looked at issues that we've decided to report to us and said something about it. Maybe useful down the line if we find out that that's not true. Like I'm going to be asking for, what, how much could we put in, the, in terms of requirement what needs to be in that? Could we be more specific? 
specifications, things that we would want them to address. I don't know what those are. Some of those are going to get pretty technical, mm -hmm. which is why I'm asking the staff about it. Right. Uh, but is that something that's within? Uh, I, I don't know. I've added it to the list, and certainly in this under this topic of long-term enforcement and then where the line is for what we can and can't request. I, um, it might help just to give some sort of general background. I think from reading the different uh, acts that the FCC has passed, I think they are sympathetic to um, to local zoning issues to some degree, but I think that their mission and their focus really is to say, we want these facilities, and so we'll let you do some things, but in many cases, you can't do what you might wanna do, because we're in charge, and, and these are sort of, the, this is where our purview is, and you can maybe have some of this. <laughs> so that's just a, a perspective, just having read some of this material. But we certainly can pursue it to find out where the line is. You know, I think, excuse me, it's helpful at least to know, even though if we can't do anything, I think questions come up and we don't know and council won't know and the public mm -hmm. doesn't know and it's, I think it's helpful to know. Maybe the FCC requirements are more than satisfactory. Maybe they have to comply with ongoing uh, right. testing and measure of, of compliance with radiation and other health impacts that mm -hmm. might come up. So maybe it's fine, we can ask. it'd be helpful to know, I think. Yeah, right. Okay. Just, just glancing through the different sections, um, 18.60.260 mm -hmm. actually has really clear specifics, but we could add to them when we get to that portion, because it talks about what the how to are. test for that sort of radio frequency radiation. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a small little municipality, we have to comply with the FCC, but it looks like there's some provision even to the point where the city manager can go back and ask questions. Uh, and it looks like obviously there has to be an electrical engineer who runs those tests, right. but there isn't you know, maybe going back and see, finding out, can we request, not just when the thing gets turned on, but is there some kind of a annual test, or just so we right. can inform the public. Right, I, yeah, I think that's what Doug was getting to, that mm -hmm. we can figure out where the line is, what the FCC is doing in terms of monitoring the testing, and then, um, because it would go a long ways to the public if we could present, not mm because -hmm. not we want to dig into this deeply, mm -hmm. but if we can provide some kind of overarching understanding of this is how it works, this is what our part is, right. and these are the changes that we've made to comply, yeah. and the public hearing is for your comment. Mm -hmm. But if we don't lay it out very transparently yeah. like that, it could cause problems. Yeah. Thanks, Carol, for pointing to that statute. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's a one-time thing, as you were saying. It does, but that's where we'd have to find out from the FCC if there is a way to reapproach them. Right. Anybody else? Mark? It, um, in terms of locational priorities, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know if this, this may or may not fit in there, but I'm just sort of curious how many of these facilities we have in the city right now Right. and where oh, they cool. are located. I don't know if you have a, you know, some sort of, fear, you know, dot map or something of that Yeah, we have sort. some information. Okay, that, I think that would be certainly useful you know, background for, mm -hmm. for that. Because we have a need to know, but we don't really need to know what we think we need to know. <laughs> I think that's kind of the trail that we're gonna be following is mm -hmm. we'll have logical questions that come up, but they might fall under that when we think we need to know, but you know, you really don't need to know You know, that. why does the name Donald Rumsfeld come to mind? <laughs> I, I don't know. That. That's, that's where it comes to mind. We still have to live our lives, right? <laughs> I'm just saying rhetorically that was really, really familiar to me for some reason. All right, anything else? Uh, just Mike. maybe one Mike. question of information. Uh, the letter, back to the letter, uh, who 
who writes the letter, who signs the letter? Is it, a, is it truly a certification or is it just a hello there, wave and goodbye? It, we could have some control over that? Yeah, it, it's required that an applicant submit the letter from an electrical engineer that has to be certified to have their license. There's an expert license. certification yeah. somewhere at the bottom. Of right, that. right. It's not just submitted by the carrier saying we comply. It, there we go. <laughs> I think it's, it may be different in each section, but. Um. Anybody else? You know, it's interesting. The ball gets rolling. We start thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. Now it's you got helpful. a ton of stuff, right? It's very helpful. Like, <laughs> right. right. Okay, I think that closes then all the questions and discussion on this. You've got a yeah. long list. Right. So I have my list, and what I would anticipate is taking this in sort of discrete chunks of related topics. Uh, to, to provide background and, and staff recommendation and that kind of thing to you. Again, not anticipating even beginning to write code language until we've discussed the topics and I have a pretty good sense of what direction you all want to head. All right, so that satisfies that element of the agenda. Is there anything else somebody wants to bring up? Any new business? There being no new business, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Great.